Hello everyone, this is Chris Condi, your chicken man, and this is episode five of No Croissant. And I'm here with my host. Hello, I'm David, uh, host of Talking Toku. And uh, Nick Huber, the host of the Visionary Dawn podcast. And today, we are here to talk about the unmade Godzilla 2, featuring our special guest, Tab Murphy, the man responsible for writing the treatment. Happy to be here. Happy to talk about Godzilla in any form. Uh, so, uh, pleasure. Thank you guys for inviting me in. So, Tab, can you introduce yourself? I, I, I have an understanding that you're a screenwriter, film producer, film director, and television writer. That your uh, your Wikipedia tells me. Uh, well, I am some of those. Uh, one of those in particular, which I would say, screenwriter but I have directed a movie. I do have an associate producer a credit on the first movie of mine that got made. So I guess that makes me a producer. And I have written animated uh, some animated series stuff for Cartoon Network, which is where television comes in, I guess. So yes, uh, you know, I guess you could say I'm a multitasker. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, on the subject of that, since you brought it up, uh, in our days, more recently, you've written for Teen Titans Go, Be Cool Scooby-Doo, and Batman Year One. Is that correct? Yes, I did Batman Year One and Batman Superman Apocalypse for Warner Brothers, which was awesome. Batman Year One was, you know, great because it was uh, obviously a revered uh, graphic novel by Frank Miller. So when they asked me to to adapt it for their version of a animated feature. Uh, through uh, Warner Brothers Animation, I was like, yeah, Billy me, this is, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that's as close as to get, you know, to writing Batman as I'm going to get. So, of course, it was a, a great, uh, it was a great assignment. I loved it. And Superman Batman Apocalypse, too, is, it's got some great Batman stuff in there, too. Like, his whole confrontation with Darkseid near the end, that's like some of my favorite. Oh, stuff. yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I really enjoyed that one, and I think uh, they were so happy with the way that turned out that they, when it when they decided they were going to do Batman Year One, uh, I'm just fortunate they they came to me to uh, to adapt it. So it was, uh, yeah, those were two. They were great projects. I mean, I really, I still to this day, uh, you know, once in a while I'll throw on Batman Year One and I'll watch it. Why wasn't this R rated? <laughs> Mainly, <laughs> however, you're uh, more known for uh, Tarzan, Atlantis, City of the Lost Empire, and Brother Bear. One of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was pooping my pants when that movie came out, but I I loved Brother Bear when I was a kid. <laughs> oh, good. a lot. Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, listen, I had a I had a big chunk of my career. I spent twelve years at Disney writing those feature animated films, and that was a great experience. And you know, I, 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 when I broke in, I, I all, you know, my focus was on live action movies. I wanted to do, I wanted to be a director. I wanted to write live action. And, uh, you know, the, the very first sort of like, I get, I would call my big break was writing grills, the mist and getting an Oscar nomination for that. So I felt like I was on my way to sort of a, a career in live action. And all of a sudden uh, this opportunity came up. Uh, uh, to go to to go into Disney and see what they were working on, and that just ended up being a left turn that I spent twelve years, in, you know, basically writing four movies in a row for them throughout the nine, <laughs> you know. So, uh, and every one of those movies, uh, I just couldn't say no to, not just because it was Disney, but because every one of those movies really resonated with something in my own childhood. Uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, I. I knew that story when I was nine years old because I was a monster nerd growing up in the sixties. And I used to collect a magazine called Famous Monsters at Fell Labs. Oh, uh, yeah. And so it you know, I was so aware of the canon of universal monsters back in the day of Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, and the Hunchback was sort of locked in with that rogues gallery of of monsters for Universal, even though he wasn't a monster, he was a man. So I, you know, I was aware I had seen the Lon Chaney senior silent film. I'd seen the Charles Lawton film growing up as a kid. So I was aware of that. And when they said in this meeting, I ended up going to that they were trying to figure out if there was a Disney animated movie. And 
Victor Hugo's novel, I was like, I'm in, I've been, I, I don't care. I want to do that. So that really launched me, uh, it, you know, into a, into a steady stream of, 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 of films, you know, like when I finished Hunchback, Jeffrey Katzenberg was, uh, the head of animation at Disney at the time. He said, Hey, we're going to do Tarzan. Any interest? I'm like, any interest? I, I grew up as a kid watching Johnny White <laughs> in Tarzan. So again, reaching back into my childhood, they were offering me stuff. And then when we did Atlantis, the Lost Empire, uh, with the same directors and producer that did uh, Hunchback uh, and a great team of artists and everything, they wanted to keep the team together, as it were. And they said, we want to do something different. We want to go into, uh, imagine going into Disneyland. We've been taking a right into fantasy land for so many movies. Now we want to make a left into adventure land and come up with, you know, a boy's own adventure. And I was like, I'm in, uh, you know, and because all of the movies we all collectively grew up with adventure movies, I saw as a kid growing up, that's, that became the genesis of Atlantis, the lost empire. And we were able to do something. We were able to like pick and choose and like cool stuff from all these movies we loved and create our own sort of, uh, it was, it was a great experience because it, 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 that movie and those characters were not based on any existing, pre-existing IP. It was something we were allowed to just cook up on our own. So that was fun. And then of course, Brother Bear, I was offered after Atlantis and I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. So I grew up in the mountains, in the forest, I backpacked. I fished, I did all those things. And so bears and that sort of that area of the Pacific Northwest. And additionally, I was big, uh, I schooled myself in native American culture and history. So when they offered that, I like, I couldn't say no to that either. <laughs> so, thank God they stopped offering me movies. I'd still be writing, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't re even realize like when we first, uh, met you that you wrote like so many classics, like even Atlantis. You know, maybe not be like the first movie you think of when you think of Disney animated, but it's Atlantis is like a cult classic. Like, <laughs> well, like I know a lot of people that grew up with that movie. Yeah, it's, it's my favorite of Disney no. Bear. Yeah, I appreciate that, guys. And that's here. I'll just share something with you. I was unaware of uh, how, just how many fans of that movie were out there. Uh, I thought for 20 years that I had written because, you know, when Atlantis got released, it didn't quite do it didn't do anything near the numbers that disney was hoping and frankly was considered at least from the box office perspective as a as a disappointment by the studio and uh and i thought for years i'd just written the i was the only writer that written the first disney animated flop of all so like and i loved the film i loved and we all loved the film and when it came out it just kind of laid there for a variety of reasons by the way um Toy Story had just come out. So there was the writing was on the wall that there was a shift. Uh, but when that movie, uh, I would, everybody loved, when it came out, everybody was just heart sick that it didn't perform <laughs> because that's your litmus test of how you're reaching an audience is, the, you know, like the box office, right? What I didn't realize was as I kind of quietly put that movie into the back of my subconscious and moved on with my career was that movie found a life on home video that unlike, you know, right. I mean, people have told me like they wore out VHS tapes of that film, ultimately moving to DVD. So during the pandemic, when we were all in lockdown, somebody reached out to me, it, just like you guys Brett, reached out to me to talk about Godzilla, uh, who ran, who runs a, a you know, a, a podcast, but it's all Disney. And they, and she asked if she could talk about Atlantis and nobody had asked to talk about Atlantis for 20 years. I said, sure. <laughs> you know, like, you know, okay, let's talk about Atlantis. So we had this wonderful, you know, uh, you know, 45 minutes and she asked me about film and all this stuff. And I kind of remembered all this stuff and I thought, yeah, it was a great experience. And at the end of it, she goes, Tab, I don't think you realize how many fans of this movie are out there right now today. It is. Like, and I, and I didn't realize, so she turned me on to a couple of, uh, Facebook pages, groups, uh, fan groups. So I was able to connect with a fan base that I thought I didn't even know existed, you know, for all those years. So that was gratifying to know that there is a big fan base for that movie out there now. And, uh, so it's been a lot of fun. You know, I send posters to fans, stuff like that. It's great. One of 
d- despite it being kind of a cult classic, it's it's nowadays definitely considered to be like one of the best of the like Disney Renaissance, right alongside Hunchback of Notre, Notre Dame too. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, I I'm proud of that movie, and I'll tell you why. Because you know we're all aware now in Hollywood, there's this push for diversity, there's this push for all of this sort of PCness, like you know. Uh, but we were ahead of the curve, man. Because you know, when you look at the the the, the group we assembled, uh, you know, you know, we had the first uh, person of color as a principal, the Disney princess Stinkita. You know, we had uh, we had, and we weren't there. Nobody was over our shoulder saying you gotta do it. And we were just like, let's you know, let's do all this stuff. Let's do all this stuff that hasn't been done. And we were just we sort of like embraced it naturally, organically. All right. Uh, so it was, uh, it was in some ways, you know, ahead of its time with regard to casting and, and, and characters and, and all of that sort of thing. And, you know, I, but I still love it. I, I watch it, you know, every, I don't know, every five or 10 years, I reconnect to it and I go, wow, you know, we actually made a very cool movie and, and, and I, so it's very cool that there is a fan base out there that not only you know, has grown, but has always kind of been there for that movie that I was unaware of. So it was really cool. Yeah. To find that yeah. uh, something you're going to love is that I saw the movie in the theaters at the time it came out in 2001, and I still have my VHS tape. You know, Nick, uh, let me just tell you, you, you know, I appreciate hearing that sort of stuff, but I get, I have gotten fans reaching out to me because, you know, I made my presence known on the fan pages and I, and and I go on there once in a while and I'll drop some tidbit or I'll post an early draft of a outline for the movie and all this shit. And they're just so appreciative of like, oh my God, any little thing they, you know, you can send our way. We want to know more. Uh, but I have had so many fans reach out to me and, and say, you know, like I, you know, I'm in linguistics because of Milo Thatch, because of that movie. Or, you know, Princess Kida was such a strong uh, character at a time in my development that, you know, I'm now doing this. I'm, I'm, I'm working for as a lawyer for social justice, but I can trace it all the way back to Kida or Esmeralda, even in uh, The Hunchback. So it's been really gratifying to keep, you know, listen, guys, as an artist, all you hope is that the things you create reach an audience and maybe have some sort of impact whether that's just to make them laugh or to scare them if it's a scary movie or whatever, that's all you do as a writer, as an illustrator, as a director. You want, you know, people to see your work and, and be moved by it. So, in you know, even though it's been a little late in coming, I have been very moved by fans coming to me and, and telling me, they have to tell me the stories of what those movies meant to them uh, growing up and how they, you know, they either got them through a dark period or, or whatever, you know, so it's, it's been, it's been really cool to understand that the, the work I did in the, for those, that 10 years and everybody associated with those movies did have an effect on people. So, yeah, Milo uh, definitely rubbed off on me because I collect a lot of uh, art books and little stuff like that. Uh, I have a bunch of Godzilla 98 material, like the Godzilla 98 <laughs> kids, uh, the art of Godzilla 98, that kind of stuff, <laughs> just to talk about like, uh, keep you focusing with uh, the podcast uh, right here. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm glad all that, all of that material from Godzilla '98 probably didn't cost you much. The characters uh, from Atlantis are, I know they're like so iconic. Like you even got like Doja Cat, who's like a massive artist right now, cosplaying King yeah, Exactly. I mean, you know, they're, it's still in the sort of the consciousness, in the cultural consciousness, uh, and because it's being brought up, brought back by people who, you know, were in, it, it made an impression on when they were young. So I say more power to you, Doja, everybody else, cosplay Kida, go for it. <laughs> I, I did want to ask you about uh, Gorillas in the Mist, which is a film yeah. I wasn't too familiar with, but it, it was a nominee for an Academy Award, which you apparently skip the ceremony to go yell tail fishing in the Baja. <laughs> Had to bring that up, didn't I? <laughs> but, you know, it, it, I've always said I do, I have no regrets in my life except one thing is that is it. Uh, because, uh, you know, I was nominated for an Academy Award pretty early in my career, and I was pretty young. And so uh, 
And I knew I wasn't going to win because I, I had already sussed out the competition. And, right. and I knew in all likelihood that Chris Hampton was going to win for Dangerous Liaisons, a movie that, you know, he wrote. And, and then he did win, actually. So I just thought, and, uh, you know, I, a buddy, like, let, there's a hot yellowtail bite in Baja. Uh, and I thought, I don't know, Academy Awards or hot yellowtail bite. And I chose the hot yellowtail bite. And, uh, and thinking, I'll just go next year when I'm nominated or the year after. What's the big deal? You know, so the hubris of youth, I've never been nominated <laughs> again, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I would probably go to the Academy Awards uh, if I were to go back in time right. and rethink that particular moment, knowing what I know now. But what do you know when you're young? I mean, you, you got nominated for one other prestigious award. I mean, you, you've actually been nominated for a Razzie for... Or is for his film <laughs> grossing over a hundred million for the hundred pack of Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the stupidest award. I mean, first of all, <laughs> that I mean, so if specific. I wrote it, they should have. I mean, if they had given me a Razzie for like my best friend is a vampire, I would have been like, I've been proud of it. But Punchback is actually a very well written script by not only myself but two or three other writers that contributed material. So I just, I, that just felt like, I don't know about that one as a, I mean, a Razzie, you know? Yeah. I, I, maybe I think an, maybe an Annie, but not a Razzie. I think, uh, I think Holly Berry, didn't Holly Berry show up for her Razzie? Yeah. Cat yeah, Wolf, yeah. Which I, yeah, yeah. I would have, yes. I would have shown up if they would have nominated something worthy of a Razzie. I've got to be, just believe me. Uh, yeah. I just, I just want to say, no, you know, everybody maybe, loved maybe... that. Maybe you would have been nominated for for another Academy Award if if Godzilla Two would have been made. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, God, Godzilla Two sweep, bro, at the Academy well, I'll Awards. Tell, I'll tell you what could have happened with Godzilla Two is that you know I may have won a, a Japanese award because I think you know, and we you guys have sort of like we've teased Godzilla ninety eight a bit, but you know my thing with it was by then by the time they asked me to write it i was already deep into collecting godzilla fig i loved godzilla's kid again i could trace right back to my childhood watching godzilla versus the thing in 1964 i was seven or eight years old on the big screen in the old my hometown of olympia when that freaking tail comes up out of the sand and starts living around i'm just like what is going on here it was you know like so I, when they asked me to write it, I had no, no qualms at all. But as I got more into it, I was like, I was hoping to like in the sequel steer things a little bit more back to a traditional telling of right. Godzilla and, 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 and that sort of thing. And, um, uh, anyway, and whether they would have, uh, listen, you know, I, whether they would have changed the design or anything at that point, I doubt, but you know, uh, oh. Before we start talking about the script itself, I actually that actually did remind me because, um, according according to your IMDb, which y you may or may not have written yourself, because uh, I only say that because you you did leave out the Razzie. Well, does my IMDb say I wrote Star Wars? Because I, I did put so. that in. So. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I don't... We'll put it back in. Don't worry. Yeah. No. We'll we'll update it right after. We'll. we'll it's also going to get updated with no croissant. Um, oh, perfect. <laughs> so uh, you you attended Washington State University where you studied forestry and wildlife biology yeah. before transferring to USC Film School. So yeah. did you did your background because Godzilla both Godzilla ninety eight and this Godzilla two treatment? What what I find interesting is even though it, it does it in like a very like silly sci-fi 90s movie way um i do like how uh godzilla 98 kind of taps into godzilla's biological functions yeah. um and his both both biological like reproduction and his behavior like it's very reminiscent of like an actual iguana so of course in, in this script that we'll be talking about soon uh godzilla lays eggs um there's there's a run there's um yeah you, you, you know he it, it's a return it's a return to form but it's still kind of grounded in like the the first movie's like kind of um biological premise 
So I, I, I guess is is your background um, as a wildlife biologist, um, did that inspire um, the work you did on the script or even in, in other movies? Sure. Uh, certainly. Certainly. I mean, you know, as I mentioned, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I always loved the outdoors. And I, for a time, believed that I wanted a career in the outdoors, I, as, either as a wildlife biologist or as a forest ranger or something to that effect. Uh, and uh, when I sort of made the choice to pivot and go south to Hollywood uh, and pursue what had was really my sort of latent passion that I never thought in a million years I, I even considered because I just it was so far away from what I knew, what I grew up with, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I had this sort of mini kind of uh, uh, crisis where I, I, I felt like that even at Washington State University and pursuing this this idea that I wanted to work in the outdoors and be a wildlife biologist, that I wasn't on the path I was meant to be on. And so uh, when I really sort of thought about it, uh, as wild and crazy as it sounded, I, I felt the real answer was I wanted to go to Hollywood and make movies and write movies and things like that. So I did that, but I never gave up. I never gave up my passion and, and my interests in this other area. So, yes, I mean, I think uh, a lot of uh, that interest and that passion uh, is is in the DNA of, in a, of a lot of things I've written over the course of my career, including Godzilla 2. Uh, you know, the movie I ended up directing uh, back in 1994, a movie called Last of the Dogmen, really, if you look at that movie, that's all of those things I was pursuing <laughs> You know, my love of native culture, native history, my love of the outdoors, my love of, uh, you know, sort of what if movies, uh, all of that is represented in that movie, which I ended up, you know, was able to write and direct. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, it, you know, Godzilla 2, uh, I just was fascinated by the biology, by the, you know, trying to ground it in some sort of organic reality, you know, a little bit, uh, about the, uh, you know, about the science of it all. Right. And uh, so, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, we're, uh, I mean, I don't know exactly about David, but I know me and Nick are kind of biology animal nerds. So I think, so I think that's why. Not so much. Oh, man. Yeah, I think that's why we have like, <laughs> kind of a, <laughs> I think that's kind of why we have a, an attraction to this. I mean, we got, I got my, my gecko down there. I got my chickens and my dog. I, 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 I uh, I really relate to your story because I, I used to want to be a vet. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's funny. My son is working as a vet assistant right now. Oh, so man. He, he loves it. You know? Yeah, I I have high respect for people that, like, work in that field. But uh, yeah. you I, know, want I, I want to do art. <laughs> yeah. marine, marine, I'm, I'm, sure I'm, a, I'm sure I'm a marine biologist, too, in another universe because... Yeah. That shit's listen. Well, there's nothing wrong with having multiple uh, interests and having, uh, you know, sort of like obviously you have to pick something, uh, right. and, and that that commands your focus in order to create uh, a career and a living, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you know having all sorts of multiple interests and being well versed in those interests is awesome. I mean, that's you know, I you know, I don't. It, it certainly, in terms of me and the stories I've written you know, has shown up in so many movies like Tarzan, you know, I mean, all of that, uh, you know, Gorillas in the Mist, of course, uh, was right in my wheelhouse at a time when I was really struggling to, to get a, I'd had jobs, but I hadn't had that one break that, you know, sort of pushes you it, into the upper echelon of, you know, of opportunity in Hollywood. And I, that came along and it was just like, it couldn't have been more perfect in terms of what my likes and passions were about the idea of a woman who was spending her life in the jungles of Rwanda and not uh, initially studying Mount gorillas who were shy, retiring creatures that was, that no one had really shined a light on. Uh, but then ultimately having to sort of like, uh, in conjunction with studying them, uh, protect them because they were being, you know, killed by poachers and babies were being sold to zoos and sick. So she was a fascinating character, but just 
for me to go over there after I wrote that script uh, while they were in production to hike into the jungles and see the gorillas sit with them, look in their eye. I mean, that was that was amazing. I mean, to the point where I didn't, that's all I did over there. I didn't even go on the set because movie sets are boring, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, and uh, it's funny too because I knew everybody associated with the making of the film. I met, I'd met uh, Michael Apton. I'd met the producers. I'd met, you know, everybody. And when I was there staying on the mountain, I'd met Brian Brown, who's in that movie as well, an actor. The one person I never met was Sigourney Weaver. Wow. And I know, right? Uh, and, you know, and, and also by, you know, in all fairness, I co wrote that movie. So there was another writer as well. Uh, but I had never met her personally. And uh, so a few weeks back, uh, I got an invitation because I'm a member of the Academy to go to a screening of Avatar 2 and then they were going to have a reception. The screening was at the El Cap in Hollywood and then they were going to have a reception at the Roosevelt Hotel. Jim Cameron was going to be there. Everybody security. We were supposed to be there. And I, so I thought, well, shoot, why don't I just, why don't we go see the movie and then go to this reception? And sure enough, we went there and there she was and an, an old director uh, friend of mine not that he's old, but a director friend of mine uh, that I've known for a few years, Randall Kleiser, who directed Grease and some other cool movies. He's like, so Gurney's here to have. So he paved the way for me to go say hello to her. She was awesome. So <laughs> I finally got a picture with her after all these years. <laughs> Very nice. Urkel, yeah. You're, you're going to have to show us. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll send it, I'll send it, I'll send it to you. <laughs> awesome. Dude, I'm, yeah, I'm... I don't know about you guys. I'm a big Sigourney fan. Some people jealous of that. Hundred percent. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone loves Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> yeah, she. Well, I mean, I, you know, when she was making uh, alien, uh, aliens and uh, you know, like I was working in a Seven Eleven, you know, down by Universal Studios. I'm just hoping someday I could work with somebody like that, or, or you know, so it it was inter It was great to come full circle. She was such a sweetheart. We talked about those days, her making the movie, et cetera, et cetera. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, uh, I've never seen Girls of the Mist. Um, matter of fact, when I heard about it, I thought it was going to be like Army Girls of the Mist. Did you say no, 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 girl, 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 maybe. Ah, yeah, you're mixing up your porno, pal. With uh, look, bro. It's a great story. So this buddy of mine has a, a like a you know a, over on the Big Island in Hawaii. He's got this film production studio, etc. There's a film uh, like class in Kona that is taught, and so I went over there to work on a project with him. And he goes, "Hey, the 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 teacher of the film uh, students that uh, is you know they have a, a building near here found out you're here, and he wonders if he can show Gorillas in the Mess to a student." And I'm like, "Sure, I haven't seen that movie in like 20 years, you know." So. That you know that night, you know all the students are there, and there's probably like I don't know thirty, and they're all in their kind of early twenties, you know, girls and guys, and all film students. They watch the movie, and uh, and uh, and and so uh, I was like, oh, the movie holds up; it's pretty good, you know. And so we have this Q and A afterwards. I'm on stage and the moderator, and and we're in a. It's not a huge theater, small theater, but. And they're, they're very respectful, all the kids, and they ask a few questions. But this is a movie that was made before that long, before they were born, right? Like it's, So then the moderator says, okay, well, thank you all very much. And oh, by the way, you may not know, but Tab wrote also Hunchback, Tarzan, Atlantis, Brother Bear, and that fucking room just exploded. <laughs> oh, my God. And then they were like, I swear to God, they were like in a line 20 deep to get a selfie with me. And all this. <laughs> wait, till my mom, <laughs> wait till my mom hears that I met you. And that girl was crying. And I was like, that is the time I realized the power of those Disney movies. It is, it was, it blew my mind, man. It just blew my mind. It was so funny. Anyway, okay, I digress. Yeah, that concludes this episode of, of No Bananas. <laughs> no Bananas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we do have a couple more questions before we deep, deep dive into the Godzilla 2 story. Um, yeah. I, I did want to ask, how was your friendship friendship with Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich, and how did that lead to your opportunity writing for Godzilla 2? Uh, well, uh, 
so that story is connected to the movie I was trying to get made as a director because uh, the same producer I had on that movie, which is Last of the Dog of Men. Is your mom calling you? <laughs> oh, sorry. He looks... Are you okay? Yeah, there's like some weird noises. If, if someone's getting murdered up there, it's it's. I'm not involved. It's okay. Just, just on. We, we can see <laughs> behind you, so if I anything hope it happens, doesn't happen we'll on you. Okay. I just, uh, yeah. I live uh, in the basement, so there's weird noises. Uh, but... Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Anyway, so the producer of Last of the Dogman was also producing Stargate, a movie that those guys were making at, in Yuma, Arizona. They were on location. I don't know if you've seen Stargate. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's like fan, it's sci-fi kind of thing. And, uh, so the, the producer said, why don't you come down to Yuma and hang out on the set and get to, you know, just see how it, everything works and blah, blah, blah. And I had no set experience. Uh, and I said, okay, that's cool. So I went down there and I met Dean and I met Roland. We got on great. I mean, we, we just became friends and, uh, Dean was awesome and Roland was great. He was great knowledge of film and so we would you know after a day's shoot they they were very generous too they let me come to dailies they let me hang out on the set you know they let me go you know like every, you know so so it was really cool and uh and you know the thing is when anybody's working on a movie aside from the director and the producer most of the crew they're they're always on the lookout for their next job you know so word got around that i was there that i was going to go off and direct a movie after you know so, you know they those guys were done and uh, some of the crew got a copy of the script and it got passed around. So they were like, wow, you know, this would be cool. And so I ended up using most of Dean and Roland's crew to go off and make my movie when they were done shooting Stargate. And so that's how I became friends with those guys. And I stayed in touch with them. And uh, we just, I, you know, I, I was on the set, uh, you know, when they they shot back in uh, here in L.A., they shot down in a big set that they built for Stargate. So I, I kept going down, just hanging out with them, chatting. And uh, and then they uh, went off to make Independence Day, you know. And, and so I saw those guys while they were making that. And afterwards, they were so excited. And I was so happy for their success. And then... Uh, you know, I they asked me if they I would write a, a, a an idea for a movie they had, which became a spec script. Oh well, they I got paid for it. In fact, you know, I ended up writing a couple of things for them that never got made. Uh, to be honest with you, um, but then they came to me and said, "Hey, after Godzilla, they said we're doing a sequel. We'd love for you to write it." I said, "I'm in." You know, I I loved Godzilla's character the time I was a kid. So uh, they kind of let me know. They were off making a movie called The Patriot with uh, Mel Gibson in those days. And so I flew to, I want to say, Charlotte, North Carolina, and they were they were down at a place called Rock Hill shooting big battle scenes and everything. So I went down, I went, I went, flew all the way out there for some meetings that would take place after the day of shooting talking about Godzilla. What could be the sequel? What could, you know, what, you know. And so there were some ideas and this and that and what what direction could it take. And so we kind of, you know, like brainstormed a bunch of shit. But they were great because they were like, okay, that's kind of, we're busy making a movie. We're going to just leave it to you, Tab. You you, you show us something that we, we, want, we can turn into a movie and yeah, we'll do it. So I had quite a bit of, leeway you know to to go off and create a direct sequel uh to the godzilla 98 movie uh but i felt like you know that movie you know really uh was kind of contained in new york and all of that stuff i wanted to open it up i wanted to open it up sort of like globally that was i mean like you know like make whatever threat to the world and to Godzilla was going to take us on a, you know, like a James Bond style. We're here, we're there, we're in Australia, we're back, you know, we're in New England, we're all over the place, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I, you know, but what you know, what you've read is what I put before Dean and Roland and they loved it. They thought it was great and they, they thought it was great and Sony wanted to do it, but they, 
did not want to give them the budget that the treatment needed to make the movie, you know, in a way that uh, Roland, uh, both Roland and Dean felt comfortable with. So it really, what, what it came down to was money. And that is because I think, uh, I think Godzilla 98 didn't quite do the type of business that uh, Sony was really hoping. It did well, it did okay. So I think they were like, they sort of balked at the number that Dean and Roland were willing to produce the, the sequel to, you know, that, you know, millions and millions of dollars. I think they had, they capped it at like, I don't know what they capped it at. I'd just be guessing, but it wasn't what, uh, 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 Roland felt comfortable making the movie, so they walked away. They walked away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard a rumor about that floating around for a long time, but I never figured out if it was true or not about the budget being the issue. It was the issue. It was the issue. Yeah, I mean, I I think everybody kind of read the script and goes, okay, it's cool, but can we do it for a price? And the price Sony wanted to do it for just, uh, you know, Dean and Roland said... Eh, you know, that we just can't do it for that. We need to do it for, you know, a, a budget that'll let us make the movie we envision. And that's where the, that's where the sort of the dividing line was between Sony and those guys. And I think they felt instead of redoing a treatment and doing a cut rate version, I think they said, you know what? I think they had other things going to, that they were interested in. Uh, and rather than doing a sequel to Godzilla, they decided to just move forward and do other things that were on their plate. And I think if Sony had said, great guys, whatever you want, we'll make it, let's do it. They may have done it. You know, They may have uh, done the sequel. But uh, as it turned out, you know, I didn't even get a chance to write the script because all those, to, based on the treatment, all those decisions were made. You know? um, so... And, and you touched on something I did want to ask you. So, were you a fan of the classic Toho Godzilla? And um, after that, I did want to ask what your thoughts are on the new American Godzilla movies. The ones that did get me. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Uh, well, of course I was a fan of the... I, you know, I, I, I think I've got our record in saying that uh, Godzilla movies in particular but that character made an impression on me at a very early age so i mean and you know over the years through all those movies uh godzilla has evolved and you know etc and his look could all this sort of thing but when i when those guys told me that i was you know that they wanted me to write it and this is before i'd gone back east of the page this is you know uh there was some time to, for me to just kind of sit with it and think about it i thought I started like looking around first I, I started, I went and watched some movies, some Godzilla movies. I caught up on some Godzilla movies, specifically the ones made in the early nineties, like Godzilla versus mm. Mothra, what they call the Hesse movies, right? The Hesse uh, yes. versus yeah. the Godzilla versus Mothra, Godzilla, you know, versus Biollante and, you know, Godzilla versus Destroyer. God, and, and as I watched more of these, I thought, yeah, you're fucking cool, man. Let's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized there were toys available, and I started. I thought, well, I'll buy a few. That's always few. how it starts. That's how it starts. How it starts. Yeah. Uh, few, he specifically purchased. Desk, he specifically purchased two thousand dollars worth of toys. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'll just put them on my desk for inspiration. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, and, uh, you, you know, uh, they were talking about a sequel with, while they were still in production on Godzilla. And, the, you know, if you remember, there was a big secrecy about what Godzilla really right. like. They tried to keep a lid on that for the longest time. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, I went down a rabbit hole, as we all have. And uh, I ended up collecting a lot of stuff. And I ended up getting, you know, like, I'm totally obsessed with needing to collect certain lines of figures. Most of them, my favorites were always Bandai. And I remember there was one Godzilla figure that they called the Glitter Godzilla. It was like the, oh. the gold ring of yeah. Godzilla collecting. Like if you could get a Glitter Godzilla, and uh, and I did. I found one with, with a box. Oh, wow. So those things go for like, what, tens of thousands of dollars only? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like that. 
I paid eight hundred dollars for it. Oh my god! But you know, I paid eight hundred dollars for it back in nineteen ninety whatever. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, so who knows what it goes for now? Uh, but it, so I yeah, I was obsessed. I was obsessed, and eBay was the only, just about the only, uh, kind of avenue you could, as a collector, could find stuff, cool stuff people would would often. And uh, I, they hated me on eBay because I, you know, I was making enough money that I pretty much outbid everybody all the time for what I wanted and paid probably way more than I needed to. But I just cut the trip down. Fuck that guy, you know. Uh, but the other, then I got a conduit to eBay Japan, and then I got guys that were looking for stuff for me. I had a network. I mean, I don't want to go too much into it, but uh, yeah, I was over the top. But I had a great collection for a while. Well, so uh, right. So all of that while I the while I was collecting all of that stuff, I was also you know sort of like trying to figure out what this next uh, iteration, uh, the sequel could be. Uh, of course, Godzilla came out. I wasn't. I'll be honest with you. I was a big fan of the way it looked. You know, I it feel felt more lizard like in so many ways than uh, the other iterations. Uh, you know, and so that's fine. That's a creative choice. I knew Patrick Petopoulos. I mean, I, I knew what, you know, what they were kind of thinking about. Uh, but uh, uh, so it came out and, uh, you know, I remember going to see it and going, okay, this was cool. This, this was kind of fun, but not in my back of my mind. <laughs> it's not, not really a Godzilla. It's kind of a giant iguana movie. If, in a, anyway, uh, but, uh, yeah, so then, uh, then I went to work on the treatment. I think I, you know, I kind of, I worked up ahead of steam by then with all this, my office turned into Godzilla shrine and, uh, <laughs> and I, I, you know, I just tried to, you know, like come up with something that I thought would be unique and kind of fun and, and, you know, to know Roland, he loves big sort of action scenes and. Uh, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I tried to throw as much of that in there as I could, but I tried to also make it a much more emotional story, uh, you know, like human emotional story between humans and Godzilla and protecting a baby and all this stuff that people can relate to, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it, always, it was fun. I had a great time writing it, and uh, I was really disappointed that uh, I didn't get a chance to even write the script that that that, it, that whole project was sort of cut off at the knees by this kind of loggerhead, uh, you know, sort of, you know, that had come to uh, to fruition over the over the book over the budget. So it was too mm. bad. Um, so what 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 did you think of the the new American Godzilla movies? Um, in your professional opinion, do they are are they well, more in line with what? I guess people were expecting back in the day when 98 came out. You know, I have to, in all honesty, I have to say that I haven't seen them all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I saw, which I saw the one with, uh, I saw the one, uh, King Kong versus Godzilla. Right. And now ironically, my partner was asked to give notes on the script for the, sequel Ooh. which oh, I, yeah. which, I, which i have read oh interesting interesting but oh, man i can't really say too much oh, because sure. she had yeah, to sign an sure. yeah. nda and if it got back to her that i was the one that let you guys know and you spread it all over they would probably be like don't worry the, this but, video uh, this, this podcast title will be a Tab leaks entire street script for yeah. Chris. You kept going on about how you wanted a clickbait yeah. title. Here yeah. it is. Yeah. Tab, tab okay. I will say, I will say, things called. Things. I will say a couple of words that will resonate with location, middle earth. Mm. Mm. Well, I think that's a given because they're, uh, yeah, mm. but. That's I know that I know that I know they explored Hollow Earth in the the last film, that's and I, uh, yeah, Middle Earth. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, I was that's like, yeah, Middle Earth. Earth. Yeah, yeah. 
Whoops, <laughs> yes, it's a matchup. Lord of the Rings and Godzilla. And that would make a shitload of money, for sure. He, he crosses <laughs> into the Lord of the Rings universe. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Hollow Earth. Hollow Earth. Hollow Earth seems to be uh, their... I don't know, do you call it a plot device? It's just like... Yeah. MC, yeah, it's like MCU's alternate universe bullshit. Just to like explain everything happening. It's like, oh yeah, Hollow Earth. It's 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 huge. So it's just like, okay, infinite movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And radiation's yeah. magic in the movies. Yeah, yeah, I think that if you like, I don't know if you like Godzilla versus King Kong, but if you did, this one probably ramps it up. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. I, yeah, I have, I have. I'm sorry. I just have to take quick break i gotta let a little kitty out the door oh sure thing okay okay i hear you all right guys tab tab's not here so uh what do you what do you folks what do you folks think about the next uh godzilla monster race film (laughs) he's he's not here i think he's in paris by his razzy (laughs) (laughs) yeah i didn't even win i was only nominated by the if i won i mean you know that would be right on the shelf back there kyle (laughs) Uh, so, okay. oh my good. Yeah, All right, rats. so just just one more question before we actually yeah. finally get into the treatment. So I gotta go in five minutes. What are you nuts? <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so Godzilla the series is as you as you may know is the cartoon adaptation of yeah. the film. Um. This plays out as a direct sequel to the movie. Um, however, as 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 we all know now, it's the only sequel to the movie. So it actually shares many of the same story beats in the sense that um, there is a monster island. Uh, there's a baby that hatches and it imprints on Nick. Um, Nick helps to escape and he um, leads it to water. And then uh, he shows up. Hicks finds them later, fully grown. Like, it's almost like the exact... I, well, I knew that they'd use that, and they didn't pay me a dime. Yeah, and so... I, I could have taken them to the mat for that. It, it's similarities. Everybody pointed them out. But by that time, I'd moved on. I didn't really give a shit anymore. You know, like, if they were going to... You know, I just didn't... It didn't seem worth it to me, uh, uh, because they would probably fight and say, well, we came up with... It's what anybody might come up with in that scenario. It's not just exclusive to your efforts, whatever their reasoning would be. Uh, but yeah, I've heard that over the years, and and I haven't watched. To be honest with you, I don't. Okay. I've never seen it, so I I can't really say one thing or another. Uh, but you know, I mean, it's similar to something that happened very early in my career, which is I should have had a writing credit on Coming to America, that old Eddie Murphy. Hmm. I run. Yeah. So we won't, we won't, well, that can be for a later podcast when the okay. non Godzilla <laughs> subject, uh, able, you know, talk about, so, but anyway, but I, you know, that's just, you know, you, you, I've been doing this for 40 years, guys. You spend enough time in this town and something bound to happen. You know? Right. But I'd rather have it, have it happen early in my career than later. In my career. But at, in this instance, I didn't, it didn't really, I just didn't want to make a fuss about it. Somebody was, you know. But I, I was, I heard through the grapevine that there were similarities, that there were right. parts of it that were used, you know. So you're saying this isn't that no, that was not coincidental? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay. Well, everybody at Sony read it, you know. I mean, uh, Dean and Roland championed it, and so there were a lot of eyes on that treatment. And whether right. you know, ultimately, the decision to make this animated series, you know. Uh, you know, and it's probably different enough that they just borrowed maybe a couple of things. It doesn't, right. you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's even like a, I think there's even a, like a kind of wasp insect creature later in the series or multiple maybe, which, I, so maybe one or more of those is. Damn it. I'm <laughs> suing now <laughs> because you mentioned that. <laughs> you know, plus, plus, I think there was like yeah. three. So. Okay, maybe not like, say. Right, so like you got to three separate times, three different lawsuits. <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I was calling you guys as witnesses. <laughs> you got yeah, yeah, send one for Cedera. Got send the second one for Queen B, and the third one I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Even Godzilla versus Megaguirus, right? Is a is a is a kind of an iteration of what I was going for. 
Toho made that one. So, you know, and I know Toho read the, I know they read the treatment too, you know, because that all, they were part of that whole process. Well, that's four losses. You got to sue Toho okay, now. Okay, no, there, there's the fourth oh one. Right here. <laughs> Maybe we can retire. <laughs> no, can you guys sue us just for good measure? <laughs> Anyway, I mean, there's a lot of borrowing, and especially in a genre of movies like this, um, you know, people, whatever. I mean, it's, uh, I, 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 you know, like, it just is, it happens, and it's, you know, if it was blatant, if they just absolutely made the treatment I, I wrote and, and just, you know, threw it in my face. I, of course, I would have done this by now. But it's so hard to prove that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. Access, access number one and number two that it was absolutely used the way it was and all that stuff. Anyway, I, you know, and I, I respected Dean and Rolla's decision to walk away from the table at that point, and uh, and I did too, sort of emotionally and every other way. So, yeah. Good. Uh, one. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to go ahead, Chris? Uh, I was just gonna say, once some kids stole my homework answer, so I know I know exactly how you feel today. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> you were you were paid handsomely for that homework. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a question I had was: so for the queen, you know, insect monster in the movie, yeah. when, was she partially inspired by Mothra? A lot of people have been asking about that. Is like, did were you inspired uh, by Mothra to come up with that? Well, you know what was inspired by Mothra was I think in the treatment I had the egg that had been uh, in, I think, discovered in where Sydney, that they'd built this enclosure over it. Mm. That was completely Mothra. I mean, you know, I mean, that was completely Godzilla versus the thing or God, you know, back in 1964. Uh, so, yeah, I borrowed, I tried to borrow tropes. I tried to borrow images. I tried to borrow stuff from Godzilla movies that I, that I loved. Uh, but growing up. So, uh, was she though? I mean, I, I, we never even got to the point where we were able to produce artwork in support of, uh, the, you know, like right. the treatment. So, but my vision of her was very, I mean, probably closer to Megaguirus than to Mothra, to be honest with you. <laughs> Some, something badass that was scary, like a murder hornet like mutated murder on it was what I was thinking of. And, uh, and so not so much Mothra, but you know, a flying insect. Now, I mean, had we gone down the road with this and had we developed it further, uh, who's to say Mothra couldn't have been in this. Movie? Right. In a way, you know, as a, the antithesis of this flying insect, you know, ravaging the world. She helps Godzilla and, or, or whatever. I mean, I never even got, we never even got a chance to have those discussions. With mm -hmm. Yeah. It, and I, and I did want to ask, oh yeah, spoiler alert for people who have never read Freeman. There is a, there, there is a new monster. <laughs> spoiler alert um, for a movie that didn't get made. <laughs> I don't know if I can spoil something like that. Uh, I, yeah, I did want to ask, like, did, did Roland Emmerich or Dean Devlin, like, give you instructions? Like, all right, so we want a new monster or were they like, we only have the rights to Godzilla. So don't put anything else in there or no, 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 they were. So I said to them, look, I mean, you know, what can we do? We can't do a sequel where, where it's just about Godzilla. We now have to right. open the world up. We now have to invite, you know, something else in. And we now have to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, we have to address this idea at that at the end of Godzilla ninety eight, Matthew Broderick's character in Godzilla, you know, he watches Godzilla die, and it's very he is very affected by that. And uh, and so I was like, we need to so here's what has to happen in the sequel, in my opinion, we need to develop if if you want uh, Nick Tatopoulos to be in the movie again, his character, then he has to be uh, it, more than just wanting to study these creatures, he has to have some sort of relationship with them, uh, with this new, you know, with, and how do we, you know, I, I worked out this idea that he found the baby and he let it, released it, and it recognizes him several years later, and it's now big and all that sort of imprinting, all of that's biology, all of that's 
you know, that happens in the wild, you know? Um, so I thought that's the way to create a relationship between Nick and, and the, and the Godzilla that stars in this movie. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, and they were like, and I said, we need a, we need a new threat. Cannot be Godzilla. This is the turn where Godzilla protects, you know, uh, you guys had him destroying in the first movie. That's awesome. But, you know, the legacy of Godzilla is ultimately he's a protector, not, uh, you know, later on, of course, in some of the other but movies, he's, he's a bit of a destroyer. Uh, but uh, I said that way, you know, like we need to open up the movie. We need to invite another monster in. We need to, you know, like we need to like deliver on the promise of what Godzilla movies have been delivering for decades, right? Uh, so they, and they were all in, they were totally agreed with it, you know? It's awesome. Uh, real quick, uh, if, if you could give the insect monster a like canon color scheme, like let's say like, you know, like what, 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 what color would the murder hornet be asking for a friend who wants to draw the thing? Oh, I was about to ask right. Nick, are you asking for a reason here? Yes. <laughs> I envision it as a sort of like, you know, how it, it has kind of a waspy thing, including a thorax and an abdomen and all of these things that, it, but I imagine the top half would be almost black with just red eyes and, and like really scary sort of mandibles and that, and that the bottom half would have been, you know, like where you could play with a color scheme for the abdomen. And that the stinger would be one of these things that would retract, but when it came out, it was just like wicked, like serrated edged fucking go through boats, go through metal, you know, kind of thing. And I, you know, I got stung enough as a kid growing up. So this was my revenge for all those yellow jackets. <laughs> yeah, that's also, it's probably a yellow jacket. <laughs> Nick, Nick, that, that description reminds me of, um, Tab probably won't know what the fuck I'm talking about, but <laughs> do you do, do you remember uh, when Godzilla unleashed the video game? They originally had a set of monsters that they had fans vote yeah. on, and one of them was the lightning bug. Yeah, the lightning bug. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Games. I, I just kind of kind of reminds you of that, except uh, with the stinger at the end. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that would have been cool. Like, and that's that's a great thing about being in a room with really creative, fun people. It's like somebody could have said, well, in addition to this wasp creature, maybe it has this ability, you know, to rally the other wasp by you know, its abdomen glows like a lightning bug. And everybody, and they all, the rest of them come, and then they fucking attack at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what could have been? So, proof history, Sony originally wanted to produce a trilogy um, and they obtained the rights to Godzilla back in 92. After the first film's success, pre-production of the sequel began shortly after with a treatment being written by Tab Murphy. Um, and then I, I wrote, I don't know if this is the exact, I kept this pretty vague because obviously I don't know the, the exact reason why this was canned, but I did write lack of enthusiasm for the audience, critics, and other creative differences like obviously Roland Emmerich and Dee Devil not exactly getting the budget they asked for. Yeah, that um, was the main reason. That was the main reason. And then, I mean, creatively, yeah. you can always kind of solve shit. Really, I mean, if you really want to make it, but when you're not given enough money to, you know, make the movie you want to make, it's really, you know, it's Fisher cut bait time, and and they cut bait, and, you know, and I I think they walked away and immediately moved on to other things. So yeah, I mean, and then Toho came back out of early retirement. And released Godzilla 2000, which th 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 there's some rumors that like Sony wanted to like make a sequel to Godzilla 2000, but it, it seems like something that was either briefly considered or didn't happen because I just found it on what yeah, I, I, I want to say, say there's a treatment <laughs> floating around for that film as well. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Oh, shit. Yeah, the, 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 I remember there was an article was published on it, and the idea was absurd. Like, Godzilla would have ended up oh. in a coma, and then he fights a volcano bat monster or yeah. something. Oh. Why, I, why, did we, why did we interview this guy? We should have found the... I believe that yeah, the, no, the article kidding. on that is on our good friend Keith Aiken's website, Sci-Fi Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's Tab. Yeah, Tab, Tab should know Keith, yeah. 
Um, we just interviewed Keith last week. Oh, did you? Great. Yeah. But you're going to have to have Steve Rifle on. He might be. He's fun to talk to. Maybe. Uh, I could reach out to him if you want. If you don't, that's fine, too. I think, sure thing, uh, I might be friends with him on Facebook, so we, I can... I I might be, too. We're, we're trying to find, like, Patrick Stopolis. I, I do have... I am in contact with one of the stars of the movie who, who is deeply considering being on the show, but they didn't seem that enthusiastic about it. So we'll we'll see how that goes. But yeah. we're just trying to, yeah, we're we're this whole show is like a love letter to like a very niche topic. <laughs> I, I, I mean, to be honest, I'm like I guess I don't know. I don't want to say joke of this podcast because. We all did grow up on this movie, and we we do like this movie, but I guess like, I get it. What's like, I guess like the whole goal that was like how, <laughs> how long can I stretch out this one movie that has like seventeen percent of Rotten Tomatoes <laughs> and stretch it out into like this long, actually interesting show? That's funny. I mean, I I recall you saying originally you wanted to do ten episodes. This is already episode. Five, I want to say. So we're halfway there. It's up to you. To Dude, we don't. I, I, I got the whiteboard up on my wall. We still got to talk about uh, the video games, the Stan Winston movie, um, the marketing. I, I even have, like, as an extra, I have Reptilian written down. <laughs> Which, if, if, Tab, if Tab doesn't know, Reptilian is, it's like kind of like, it's basically the 90s equivalent to, like, one of those asylum movies. But it was it was like a it was like a Godzilla ninety eight ripoff, really. But it was also yeah. a remake of a nineteen sixties Korean monster movie as well, Yongari. Yeah, yeah, Yongari. Oh, Yongari. I know Yongari. Yeah, yeah. It was the Yongari. remake of that. Yeah. Okay. In in the movie, Yongari even destroys a Godzilla ninety eight poster. <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, and not, there's a not lot in the but. Yeah, and there's a line in the movie where the military's fighting him, and they said, compared to this guy, Godzilla's a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how did that movie do? Uh, I don't even think I've seen it all the way through. Oh, yeah, no I'm kidding, man. That is wild. Well, I, you know, I, you know, I was, I don't know, I, I was conflicted because I, I didn't want to walk away from it. I wanted to write it, and I was hoping against hope that, uh, you know, Legendary and Sony would, like, bring me, at least give me first pass at whatever they mm -hmm. were going to do later down the road. But that never happened either. I'm sure they associated me with those two other guys. <laughs> uh, uh, before we... Oh, you're on team. Devlin and Everett, get out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we jump to the next thing, something I wanted to ask you was, what did you think about uh, Godzilla 2000 when that came out shortly after? I was disappointed. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, like, I just, I just, again, Toho has made some great movies, and they've made some not so great Godzilla movies. It always comes down to story. You know, it always comes down to story. Like, fucking Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, 93, that is great. Godzilla vs. Destroyer is also one of my favorites, but it just was better, sharper writing, better, you know. So Godzilla 2000 just felt, I don't know, it just it, it didn't quite resonate with me the way some of those others that I consider sort of classics, you know, mm. uh, did. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, I love 2000. It's definitely not one of Toho's strongest. Um, no, I just didn't, it's just... Uh, you know. 2000, I think, resonates with a lot of people from like our generation because yeah. it got that big, big wide release here in the States. So it was a lot right. of people's first. It, it, it did well. It did well. Yeah. It did well. Uh, I don't even recall if I went to see it on the big screen, but I, uh, I, yeah, I just, uh, I think I saw it and I was like, uh, you know, sometimes you watch a movie and you go, what could have been? And that's what I felt about that one. What could have been? I mean, they had all the, the stuff there and just didn't, but to me, it always comes down to the writing, the story. And, you know, like, I just felt like that one fell a bit short. Yeah, to be fair, it did have a very kind of rushed production from how... It yeah, was it, that, the went. whole thing felt rushed. That's yeah. my problem, yeah. you know. Although yeah, I did end up with a... Uh, speaking of collecting, I did end up with one of the short bin things off the suit. Oh, wow. Oh, very good. Nice. 
Nice. <laughs> Very cool. I know. I know. I know. Uh, I am I met the guy who built the suit. Uh, she needs to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 David, did you meet him? Because uh, I what, 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 Yes. Yeah. I, oh, I we met him. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Wakasa. He's he's a G. He he did a lot of the he did the Heisei movies too, right? And a lot of the Melania yeah. movies. Yeah. yeah, he's he's been around. I mean, there was a picture of him with the. I think he's friends with Patrick, and he is. There's, yeah. there's pictures of him with the '98 like Macatten suit. So oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it's, except the Toho, they were kept abreast of all that. The look of it. So they they were the ones ultimately. I think that. I don't know if they had final approval, but, but I know Dean and Ron were adamant about moving away from the traditional look Great. Mm. and wanted to make it their own. They wanted to make <laughs> something that was good and they did. <laughs> I mean, that, that reminds me on, on like an unrelated tangent. Um, but I, it, this happened recently and it's not, it's not every day you get like Godzilla 1998 news. So I did want to mention it. The official, like, Sony, like, prop social media. Did you guys see this? They released, they, <laughs> they pulled out one of the baby suits and they did, like, yeah. a skit. Yeah, and they did, like, a skit with it where they, they, they wheeled the baby around and they, like, overlaid, like, a voice and stuff. How, how, when was this? Like, it was last week. week. Oh, like, yeah. last week. I <laughs> did you this. not? <laughs> okay. No. We gotta, I, I would not send in the group. It was so, Please. yeah. First off, the suit looks great, considering it hasn't been touched in like 25 years. Yeah. yeah. But second off, it was like, why the f- who asked for this, right? <laughs> like, like, yeah. like, he's like, it's like, I'm going, I'm going to the studio. I need my this car to sign in. Oh, there's Bob over there. Hi, Bob. He's like, <laughs> 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 well, you know, you guys have seen, you guys have seen all those TikTok videos of the, the T-Rex suit walking oh, yeah. around everywhere. 100%. Yeah, Every yeah. time I see that, that gives me Godzilla 98 PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks like one of the babies. You know? Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, and that that's something we touched on a few times. Like Godzilla '98, like I mean, it, it it was it's very 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 far from the typical Toho form, but I think I think it's still a lot hell a lot like more faithful than like people give it credit for, especially in like the like dude, it was an American movie. They told him he'd gone all CGI, but they they actually did use. Uh, you know, classic Godzilla suit mation for some of the scenes and for both Godzilla and the babies and even miniatures, which I own some of the miniatures over there. So, nice. you know, I, I don't know. I, I appreciate it for that. <laughs> there were also artistic choices that were a bit divisive amongst the Godzilla fans too. I mean, you know, Roland Cheers chose to shoot a lot of sequence, rain and the dark and there were just, uh, there were sequences where, you know, Godzilla wasn't all that visible, you know, until the, you know, like late movie and, and even, yeah, it just, uh, was an interesting choice. I mean, most, a lot of those sequences were shot at night, right? So it's, uh, it's just an aesthetic that, you know, uh, I would obviously, if, if you read the, read the, this, the treatment for the sequel of moved away from immediate. There was not yeah. going to be any confusion that this was going to be a dark kind of brooding, you know, night raining shit going on while that all this destruction is happening. So, yeah. uh, and from that, that's about that common. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's... Godzilla did it. King of the monster. Godzilla King of the monsters did it. Godzilla versus Kong did it. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Rim Sorry. did it. Yeah with that weird one yeah this is frame did it i mean i i get it it looks good but yeah you gotta give like i like how in chlorophyll if you've ever seen chlorophyll um yeah that's I, close good. yeah i i i like how most of the scenes are at night of the monster and you kind of yeah. don't get like a good look at it until the very end when he eats um tj miller you get yeah. like a nice clean view in the daytime of it and then you, you yeah. fully get to like Get up you, close and personal with this monster. It's so cool. Such a great scene. Like, oh, you sorry. Get away with that when the monster is new, when it's right. 
but you can't get away with that with Godzilla. I, exactly. Just decades and decades of of people at, of, of this this uh, creature being beloved or hated or whatever, but always being shown. So it was an interesting choice, I thought. Uh, but anyway, I mean, you never saw him in, in broad daylight stalking across the land, right? Destroying it. It just was a. They just decided to go for a, a look and. And that was it. So, yeah. Uh, there was an earlier shot in Cloverfield where, when they're escaping through the helicopter, you see a really good shot of his whole body, uh, like stepping through the buildings. And then he gets hit by the yeah. block. And yeah. Oh yeah, Nick. They uh, not to go on another tangent, but in Godzilla King of the Monsters, the the new one, um, there there's a scene where they're showing all the Titans, mm. and there's this big spider Titan. And they're they're showing like news clips and stuff, and when they're showing the Spider Titan, it looks suspiciously like that exact shot. And according to my friend, who I won't name him because they were under NDA, he saw an early screening, and he told me that they we they were like using like a lot of like stock like music and stuff and footage. Apparently, that scene just straight up uses that Cloverfield footage. What? <laughs> really? So, so they must have like literally copied it one to one. Yeah. But by the time they released it, wow, it's interesting. That is and interesting. to go on another Cloverfield tangent, um, there was a rumor when that movie, uh, when that trailer first dropped, that it was gonna be sequel to Ninety Eight, <laughs> <laughs> which is hilarious. <laughs> Ten years <laughs> after the fact. And you're yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. Look, man, fans' imaginations, by the way, are ever expanding. Look, it, as much as that wouldn't happen, I do kind of like the idea of like a Godzilla movie that like isn't marketed as one, and like you only find out at the end. Um, I mean, uh, M Night Shyamalan did that with a uh, split. At the end, oh, it yeah. revealed it. At the end, it revealed its um, <clears throat> what's it called? Fuck, the movie before. Um, it's an unbreakable sequel, but it only gets revealed to the end. So, can you do that with Godzilla? Absolutely not. But it would have been. Cool. I was gonna say he would, uh, he would not make it as a studio executive, my friend. Right. <laughs> you, you know, uh, if you were suggesting that, but that's okay. <laughs> you, you know what's been hilarious it's like for the trailer like all the Cloverfield trailers are just like what they were let's just say it was going to be a Godzilla 98 sequel then right at the like near the end of the trailer it does the title card thing but it says guess who does matter and it says <laughs> <"Guess who laughs> matter. like so the signs does matter it's like guess who still matters oh my god, oh my god. that was such a dumb fucking <laughs> it was it was <laughs> So good. Anyway, I guess we should actually talk about the treatment now. <laughs> yeah, we gotta, I gotta sign off at six, gentlemen. Oh damn! I, so, yeah. Okay, so is that in thirty minutes? Yeah, like twenty-five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 I'll I'll keep track of that. So the treatment picks up um, where the first movie leaves off. Godzilla is dead, and Nick searches for any remaining babies at Madison Square Garden. Nick finds a hatchling who immediately sees Nick and imprints onto him. Becoming very fond of the creature, Nick assists the creature by disguising him in an overcoat and leading him in the water. Um, so, so actually, uh, I, I have a question about that. Was that at all inspired by the Marvel comic where that exact <laughs> thing happens? Fuck you, David. I was going to ask that. Fuck you, David. <laughs> <laughs> what what Marvel comic? Is it a Godzilla comic? It's a Godzilla comic. In the 70s, Marvel ha had the rights to do Godzilla comic, and that's, I think, Hank Pym, Ant-Man, shrunk him down to, like, get rid of him or something. Oh, oh is that right? Yeah. No, no, yeah. I, I will. Uh, no, I wasn't aware okay. of that, but, uh, no, I well, thought it would, you know, like, you know, I was... the. Yeah, you know, the baby Nick finds is not as big as the babies that were around in the '98 movie. You have to understand it's probably small, so he could put a coat around it, right? Yeah. And I just thought the bit with the bum coming up and asking for money and this thing lunging at it and him screaming and you know, right, I thought that would be fun, you know, to do something like that. And then ultimately, <laughs> tough love of Nick having to you know scare, you know, throw a rock at it or scream at it or get away, you know. 
that's a trope. We've seen it, but it would have been cool on the Godzilla movie. I thought I I genuinely thought that that was a like deliberate Marvel reference because I I just sent you the panel on Facebook. It's I I forgot. It, it's been like eight almost probably 10 years since I've read this comic. So it's been a while, but I, I oh, do remember God. this issue that they, they literally hide him in like a hat and like a jacket and they like walk yeah. him down the street. <laughs> it's well, the worst. All I, say, ever. all I can say is great minds. Think a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I and man. And, and this scene, like in general, like just makes you almost kind of wish this movie to come out because it, it just screams at like kind of early two thousands, late nineties kind of like movie humor. <laughs> like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, all right. So after an entire village disappears, a cruise ship found adrift, uh, and a jet ski is sliced in half near Australia. General Hicks and his team is tasked with investigating these anomalies. Felipe kidnaps Nick at his own wedding with Audrey. Which is super interesting, um, but I guess like my only, I guess like criticism of that is, this is the last we see of Audrey in the entire treatment. Well, it is. Uh, we hear her voice as he tries to talk to sense into it. I would like say, "Why explain?" And she's yelling at him and hangs up on him. Yes, it is. Right, it is the last. Yeah, I, I we we all kind of agreed on this um, when we did our Godzilla ninety eight review, Audrey we felt like didn't add a whole lot to the first movie, but it would have been interesting to see her. her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it it kind of, it kind of would have been interesting to see her character redeemed though. Um, I mean, we're, we're fucking criticizing your script from 25 years ago. Like we're going <laughs> to, you know what I mean? Like, um, I, I thought it was an interesting decision to just completely remove her, but I love how Philip just like rolls in there. It's like, oh, you call this movie opening and just like, it's the wedding. <laughs> yeah. And like, oh my God. Like the, he, he pulls up in a limo. Nick gets in the door shut and he's the fucking driver. It's like, this is like this here in nineties. Like, well, it's also the type of thing that Dean and Roland would have loved. Yeah. You know, that, oh no, the sure. That kind of humor, that kind of stuff. So. No, uh, this is so. Yeah, no, I just they, I had to get rid of her right away. <laughs> I, I wanted to show that Nick and criminal kind of, kind of Nick had settled for something, and he had moved on from his adventure with Godzilla. This was him, kind of like, ah, well, I would, you know, like going with the, uh, you know, sort of like what's expected of him. And then there was what's his name to remind him. No, go, let's go. All right. You know, put, on another adventure. I'll put in quotations, I needed to get rid of her as the thumbnail. Next <laughs> <laughs> to your face. And I'll put police called in the title. Um. So, uh, yeah, I mean, after that, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm very much paraphrasing the entire, it, it's a long treatment. <laughs> it is a long So, yeah. uh, Obviously, it you know Godzilla grows up to be an adult. Um, it's found out that he's alive. Felipe finds out that Godzilla's alive, and he needs Nick's help. Um, of course, it ends up being it's not Godzilla; it's it's the Queen bitch. Um, after going to Australia, the, the, I like there was also within the human you know characters there was a a double cross. There was a felt of, of a feeling of betrayal and all in this kind of stomach right. building right. that as well. So, uh, you know, if, uh, I, I just didn't want it to, you know, you try to do something in a movie like this, even though everybody comes in with an expectation, whereas the giant lots is kicking each other's ass. That is awesome. So where can you, you know, like, uh, where can you have, you know, some, something that's, you know, that that's conflict that's, you know, like, uh, where's the human drama, what happens, et cetera, et cetera, because you know, they're, they're staples, which is Godzilla's going to fight this thing and then, you know, he's, he's going to win. I mean, that's the staple. So, you know, with the, uh, you just try to play around with uh, expectations in other areas of a movie like that right. so that you keep your audience interested, but they're, they're going to get what they came for 
but you still want them to be invested in characters. You still want them to be along for a ride that includes more than just monsters fighting, right? So that's right. And and I will say, um, besides uh, the whole kidnapping by Felipe, sorry, this whole segment of the script. <laughs> is like almost word for word what happens in the series. Uh, so Godzilla escapes, obviously uh, leads in the water, Godzilla escapes. And then all of a sudden there's like the, I, I forgot exactly what happens. I'm sure Nick remembers uh, there. I think there's like a, there's either like villagers that go missing or there's like, yes, there's yeah. all sorts of people that go missing. And I was using the, uh, you know how the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 what, what is the Bermuda triangle thing? Right. Ships floating. Where are the people? Ship. That was the whole, you know, for me, I yeah. wanted to set up this mystery about where are the people, what's happening. So, you know, so the blame of God, the Godzilla, but still. So I, so, you know, I had a lot of fun with that. The idea of, you know, like everybody tried to guess where the people were, then it's all revealed on monster. I, right. So, so that happens in the cartoon as well, or basically more or less. Um, and it gets split and then Hicks finds out Godzilla's alive. Uh, Felipe finds out Godzilla's alive. Felipe goes to Nick to contact him and <clears throat> Hick, Hicks um, is ordered to like go kill Godzilla. Um, but then it's found out that Godzilla isn't responsible for all that. It's actually, uh, his, na his name's like Gus Gustafo, right, Nick? The big slug monster. Yes. So... It seems like they 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 lifted that whole portion up from your uh, script, and even like later, later in the script, uh, Hicks is ordered to kill all the babies, um, and then I think later in the in the script, he's he has the opportunity to kill Godzilla as well in the run, and I think he gets uh, convinced to spare them since Godzilla ends up being their helper. That also happens in the series. It's, uh, it spares Godzilla. Is there is there any universe where I actually stole my treatment from the series? <laughs> <laughs> no, it can't. Uh, you know, unless uh, so. Okay, well, thank you for uh, uh, letting me know that I was ripped off royally. And another thing too is they repeated the plot with the uh, the queen uh, twice. They did that with the queen. Wa they did it with the queen wasp. They did it with the queen termite, which also had a colony making people disappear, like the wasps. And these were episodes like in the same season. And then they did uh, Skeetera, which was kind of like. A little bit of a mix of that with some powers of Mega Gears. Oh, right. Bit. And I, I guess we'll go on another tangent because why not? Because we're about to get into the 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 winged creature that I, I mentioned. So yeah. Queen Bitch, um, was that like her official name? Because I kind of can't imagine Queen Bitch being on the toys at Walmart. <laughs> but yeah. that's just that's yeah. to me. Yeah. Or, or seeing the Toho trademark on that Queen Bitch <laughs> Toho trademark. <laughs> 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 No, that was my little flourish. <laughs> uh, and, I, you know, I just, uh, you know, I, I, for lack of a better uh, character name, I wanted to make it clear that she was the villain of this movie, so that's kind of why I used it. Obviously, it never would have. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think she would have been referred to as Queen Bitch in the movie if it had gotten made, but for the purposes of the treatment, just to let everybody know that she was a badass and, uh, you know, so. Yeah. If you could give her like a full name, what would you give her? Like aside from the, you know, the, the queen bitch name. Uh, I don't know. You know, I probably go look into the biology of bees and wasps and find some description that I would feel like, Ooh, that's gross. Okay. Let's call it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. When in doubt, just use like the regular Toho naming conventions. Name it like Skeetera or some shit. Like, yeah. Well, I'd probably call her Stinger. I'd probably call her Maybe. Stinger. That actually kind of sounds badass. Stinger. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's that's the canon name. That's that's a, that's a name. What's the official name? That's the official name. At that Tabo said. Um, so obviously, later down the road, um, Godzilla's birthplace, 
or Godzilla's new birthplace is dubbed Monster Island, which, you know, obviously clear Toho reference. Um, sure. We eventually see Godzilla fight the Queen Bitch, who is a winged insect creature. Um, the military later kills most of Godzilla's babies with a single run surviving at the end of the film. Um, and by the end of the movie, Godzilla defeats the Queen and manages to leave the island in peace with his runt son. So, basically, I mean, just judging by this treatment, it definitely looks like you're you're trying to kind of fix Godzilla 90 and bring it back to form a little bit. You know, like, Godzilla has his own, like, minia equivalent now. Uh, Godzilla actually fights a monster. There's a monster island, which... Yeah. It's a Absolutely. bunch of possibilities yeah. with a with a new monsters that could come in for for a possible another sequel, which is something I did want to talk about. Um, yeah. So no, that was all uh, intentional. That was me, you know, kind of steering it, kind of in a minimalist way, back into sort of like familiar territory, total territory. I mean, the Ian. Roland made a terrific, I mean, you know, like they had their vision of what a Godzilla movie should be, and that's great, or they did it, and, uh, you know, for better or for worse, you could argue about you know, many divided opinions about that movie, but my, I really wanted to steer it back into more so the Tobo territory with familiar tropes and this and that, and, and uh, so, and they knew that. They were, you know, they didn't go through my treatment and say, why do we have to call it Monster Island? <laughs> uh, so they were they were well aware that of my intention of, of heading in that direction. They were very supportive of it. Yeah, and Godzilla the series kind of had I don't know if you call it an issue or whatever, but Godzilla the series uh, it kind of reminds me of um, what J.J. <laughs> Abrams tried to do with Star Wars Episode Nine. <laughs> <laughs> and Godzilla the series and both this treatment um seem seem like kind of concerned with trying to like kind of half fix half like uh what's the word like um make amends with the the what <laughs> <can't laughs> <afford it. laughs> yeah, exactly. it's like yeah. <laughs> oh man and I think even Godzilla King of the Monsters does the same thing Godzilla 2014 was like this interesting it felt like kind of its own thing. And in 2019, Godzilla tried to turn it back into like regular Toho. So, right. Um, yeah. we do only have nine minutes left with you. So I, I do have a few more questions for you and I, I did want to get you, get you out on time so you could, uh, do whatever, uh, go back go to your normal drunk. life. Go get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I, so like, I, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And we did, in all fairness to you guys, we did talk about many other things than uh, Godzilla 98. So I appreciate right. that. Dude, there's only so much Godzilla 98 I can talk about. Oh, we, we had to talk about Atlanta. Yeah. I, um, I do have a non Godzilla question, but we can save that for the, like the last last thing if you if you if you prefer. Sure. Sure thing. I, oh, I do too. Oh, well. All right, cool. So I'll I'll save some time. I'll finish up my my two questions and then okay. I'll leave the rest of the show to David and Nick. Um, so I wanted to ask you, because this was obviously a planned trilogy, did you leave room for a third movie? And two, did you have anything in mind for how the third movie would play out? Well, anytime you have a Godzilla movie and Godzilla lives at the end, that's your opening to the third, <laughs> third or fourth <laughs> but then. Uh, so, uh, I wasn't, I don't recall being aware that they were going to, that there was a planned trilogy so much. Uh, I just was really focused on creating, a, you know, a sequel to their movie that would, you know, sort of like up the stakes, up the game of the, you know, and, and, and open it up and bring in other matches and do a lot of stuff that I love but it's a kid in my Godzilla movies so I mean you know obviously with Godzilla living at the end uh there's always room for a sequel the, the, the I mean if they had done a trilogy then and if they'd asked me to do the trilogy I mean the to write a treatment for this third sequel 
I wouldn't have been beholden at all whatsoever to Godzilla 98 by that point. Right. So I would have created something completely different and new. Uh, so, you know, other than, you know, Matthew Broderick's character and probably, uh, what's his name? The uh, French guy. Philippe. Uh, yeah, right. those guys were kind of, the, the, those, you know, so those guys probably would have come back for some other adventure, you know. Uh, right. But I, 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 you know, that's where the similarities probably would have ended between Godzilla 98 and the sequel. And that this movie would stand alone on its own and be, a, you know, an adventure movie, uh, you know. And, and so the slate would have been wide open to bring whatever you wanted to get, get on into that scenario. Uh, yeah. Okay. So my last question, uh, I'll try to and to finish this quick if in the current year um production companies have kind of banked on nostalgia and revivals of old ip um if the very 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 unlikely <laughs> situation where uh Toho was like all right guys let's let's make like a netflix godzilla sequel to 98 or something would yeah. um Either be on board to work on it or would like to see them use your old script. Even if it was like a comic adaptation or, or something just to tie up loose ends of the first movie. Yeah, I would listen, I wrote that treatment and I I I really enjoyed writing it and I thought it was a good sequel to what Roland and Dean had done. And I think they thought it was a good sequel. So yeah, I mean if Netflix said, Hey, we're gonna make a sequel to Godzilla ninety eight, uh, <laughs> Now write the script. Twenty years later, without clouds, I would. Of course, I do it. I mean, of course, I do it. It's like you know, when I got to write Batman Year One. You know, I, you know, some iconic characters you just can't say no to. Exactly. You know? Cool. You know? So I would do it. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be shit, but I would do it. Uh, you know, in a way that I would be, I would honor uh, the legacy. I mean, that's what you try to do with these movies, really. You know? All right. David, Nick, you got five minutes. All right. <laughs> well, so usually at the end of the show, we kind of like say what 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 we've got going on. But Tab, as I understand, for the past couple of years, you've been trying to do a remake of the Changeling. How how's yeah. how's progress going on that? Out of curiosity, if if you can say anything, I don't know what you can or well, can't no, say. I mean, and so we've been out to actors. You know, like the, that whole thing was just undone somewhere by the pandemic. We had a head of steam. We had a director. We, you know, we were out to actors, and we had, and we everybody was very excited. And then there was just this brick wall of pandemic that we hit, and everything slowed down. And so business, to the, even today, is just finally in some getting back to some sense of normalcy. So that is ongoing. Uh, so I hope you know that it gets made this year. I I always you know I hope that. You know, there's a the, the director we had has come and gone, and a new director is attached, and so that always, you know, the kind of have to start over with submissions to actors with a new director. Um, so it's in process, is what I would say to that. You know, fingers crossed. Because so, yeah. Changeling is one of my all-time favorites from the '80s. Oh, great! Yeah, no, I mean, listen, uh, you know, when uh, the producer, ironically, the producer of. Uh, Stargate, the producer of my movie, uh, Last of the Dogmen, also produced The Changeling. There you go. <laughs> so there you go. There's a, it's all a very sort of incestuous relationship. <laughs> it is now. But, uh, no, and I wrote a script. Uh, I felt like, uh, you know, I, I wanted uh, very much like I would do with Godzilla. I wanted to honor The Changeling, the original. Uh, but I think you, you know, the, the audience that saw that movie in 1980 is very different than the audience you know, that, that goes to those kinds of movies today. So I think there was, uh, you know, we had to up the game a little bit in terms of just a uh, story. Uh, and we also had to up the game in terms of scares, you know, uh, that movie kind of got under your skin and was creepy. Uh, but it, you know, like audiences these days go just, you know, like they want their scares in their face, this, that, and the other. And it's really difficult to pull off. Yeah, for sure. Like, the, yeah. the tone or the style of what the change thing was in 1980 to pull that off now and have an audience accept it. They might go into that and go, it's fucking boring, man. There's nothing happening, you know? 
And why is what's with that wooden wheelchair? Why am I supposed to be scared here? I don't get it. Why is this you know, bouncing ball supposed to be scary? What the hell? Yeah, yeah, Why exactly. Is the ball bouncing? Why is the ball? What the What's the ball bouncing? I paid for blood. I paid for blood. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's a it was a challenge, but I think we pulled it off. I think we pulled it off. I'm very proud of that script, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. So, I know you just we just did a whole podcast interviewing you. So my friend and I, we have a podcast where we interview writers and we would love to have you on about Tarzan and Atlantis. Would you be down for that in a few weeks? <laughs> Nick, you're yeah, networking on my show. I know. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but this is all about to me. So a, a podcast featuring writers. Oh my God. Do you have like two or three listeners? I don't you know, like writers aren't necessarily what people gravitate we we have like 10 on this show so yeah, you know and you just wasted two hours with us <laughs> no i'm uh i would be happy to talk about writing i i talk about writing a lot i i teach screenwriting a little occasionally and yeah. in, in forums like this online with uh, uh uh people and i i i love talking about the process you know because i've been doing it for 40 years and over the course of 40 years you you, you oh you learn a thing or two you know uh and and have a little bit of wisdom to share so yeah no of course i'd be happy awesome awesome yeah you you have my uh uh instant message just reach out to me and we'll figure something out (laughs) awesome so uh we're done Fucking talking about Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with that, we have a whole. Oh, it hit nine o'clock. Oh, no. Tab's going to spontaneously combust right now. <laughs> She's going to turn into pumpkin head. <laughs> turn to pumpkin head. After, after midnight, he turns into like a creature. We interviewed him after midnight. <laughs> Never. Rule number three of tab is you don't don't podcast after midnight. There you go. There you go. So, uh, no, I've had a I've had a blast, guys. Really, seriously, I had a good time. It was fun to revisit yeah. some of those things and uh, think about them uh, now with a little perspective uh, after all those years. So oh shit! Appreciate the opportunity. Forgot to hit record. <laughs> no, no, that's you can take that's that's David's job. Back it out tomorrow. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, we'll fix it in post. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll ask an AI to, you know, <laughs> we'll get chat AI to generate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, 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 we actually have enough voice data to make uh, Tab's voice of an AI. But yeah, it, was, it was an absolute pleasure having you on, Tab, for sure. Yeah, no, I had a I had a good time. You guys are great, and uh, a good luck. You know, Godzilla ninety eight, cool new. Of course. Oh yeah, the greatest movie ever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he ain't rolling. I. It is the greatest movie ever. If you happen to watch this, so. if, if if it's the only movie you've ever seen, it's definitely the best movie you've ever watched. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's exactly. the greatest movie <laughs> ever for that one line. That's a lot of fish. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of fish. Good night. Yeah. So, it's been no croissants, and uh, thank you so much for for coming on our show, Tab. Uh no problem. You your your story will be your story on this episode tonight will be exposed to dozens of people. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> you can solicit questions from those dozen people. <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. Um, thank you we'll, guys. We'll sign up now. Thank you so much. No problem. Take care. You too.